God says it's faithful, he'll send it out, and it will accomplish what he wants to do. Let's think about what this book contains. One, it contains the very character of God revealed. I'm a big fan of biographies and, and often autobiographies. I don't like when an autobiography is simply, I went here, I did this, I went there, I did this, I went here, I did this, I went there, I went. And a lot of them end that way. Been fascinated, different stories through the years, different people that I've listened to. But this book is who God is. I want to know who God is. Read the Bible. This is who God is. You can discover his character by this book. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Very interesting that Jesus is identified as the Word. Goes on in verse 14 and says, And the Word became flesh. And he lived among us. That God revealing his character from his word in Jesus Christ, his word, Jesus' character, they both are the same. There is no dis distinction between who Jesus is and what, it, what the Bible says. That's who he is. In the character, in the book, it's revealed of, in God's character what he likes and what he doesn't like. In the book is revealed what God expects from you. In the book, it reveals how he deals with people. That's what is revealed in the book. George Barna is a, a uh, uh, he gathers uh, and does polling information and different things, and he's a Christian. He works a lot with churches. And a while back, he did a poll, and he said he developed a new set of criteria that defined evangelism, uh, defined with evangelism and evangelistics that have a biblical worldview. This means to say that they believe that the Bible is the moral standard and absolute moral truths exist and are conveyed through the Bible. In addition, they believe that God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator who still rules the universe, that salvation cannot be earned by deeds, that the Bible is totally accurate in all it teaches, this group is significantly smaller than evangelistics or churchgoers in general. He made a discovery. He makes these absolute true statements. The Bible is absolutely perfect, morally sound. And he says most churchgoers don't believe that. They don't believe this book is absolute. That's why he went on to cite statistics of all sorts of sins that church people do and excuse away. That even, to my chagrin, some religious people have a higher regard for not doing that than born agains. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for the teaching of what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do right. God's will is revealed through his word. God shows us what to do and how to do it. I know there are specific details in life that we're trying to work out. That not everything is chapter and verse. You're not going to find, you know, tomorrow evening for lunch, thou shalt buy, thou shalt eat. Right? 
You know, you'll find that in the Bible. But what you're going to find that is, as you apply the Word of God to your life in the situations you can, He'll work out the others. Psalms 119, the longest psalm in the Bible, the longest chapter in the Bible, it's written in poetic form like A is for the attributes of God, B is for the beauty, but it's actually not about God, it's about His Word. Every letter is about the Word of God. This is what David is glorifying. And he makes this statement in Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. That somehow in the word of God, I can guarantee that if you're obeying, reading, contending for the word of God in your life, which we'll talk about just a little bit more in a minute, God will work out the details, the specifics of your life. God has a way of showing you what would be the right thing at that time. Hebrews 13, 21, that you may be equipped with all that you need in doing His will, that you may produce in you the power of Jesus Christ and every good thing that is pleasing to Him and all glory to Him forever and ever. Amen. God wants to equip you. God wants to produce in you that which pleases Him. He does that through His Word. It gives us hope. The Word of God is our hope. We know that some things aren't going to get better. You know the Word of God. It's not going to get better. Immorality is going to get worse. Society is going to get worse. Economy might get worse. But my hope isn't in society politics, or economics. My hope is in God. Romans 15.4, such things were written before in the Scriptures long ago to teach us. And the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement that as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled, knowing God's character, knowing God's working, we have hope. We can know that God is going to move. As I read the Bible, I know God moved for the weak and those who couldn't do what they needed done. God helps them. God moves. If you're living right, doing right, God will help you with that. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. That if you don't understand what God has said, then you may end up being bound. But if you'll you'll accept the truth, God can help you. In the center of this verse, Paul makes the statement about the Word of God working in you. He says, we thank God that when you received His message, you did not receive His words as mere human ideas, but you accepted what they said, the very word of God, which of course it is, and this word continues to work in you who believe. So you have to let the word of God in you. This is exactly what Jesus says with the parable on the wayward ground. No penetration. As a preacher, I've been preaching for 35 years. I've seen people, the Word of God hits them, stays there for a second, and falls to the ground. No penetration. Actually, more here. No, it but boom, bounces off. Usually there's reasons behind that. But the Word of God is filled with the thought of letting it in. Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ in all its richness fill your life. Teaching, counseling each other in the wisdom that God gives, singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts. Being filled with God's Word, reading, listening. Psalms 
songs, spiritual songs. I've mentioned before, we don't just sing the songs giving ch- people a chance to give who might be running 10 minutes late before we get to the preaching. We sing the songs to worship in, changes both our hearts and establishes the atmosphere for God to come and help us. It's interesting. Those who don't sing, often the words of God don't penetrate. Romans 10, 17, for so faith comes by hearing, and hearing the good news about Christ. Begin to realize that faith is built on the Word of God, not on feelings, not on circumstances. Some people believe God as long as everything's going good. No problem there. What happens when things don't go well? What happens when there's problems? What happens when life throws you a couple of curveballs? What happens when your problems are giving birth to problems? What happens then? I can read about David. That happened to David. I could read about Joseph. That happened to Joseph. I could read about all sorts and how God helped them. The Word of God has to be working in us. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, Paul started this whole thing. He said, for when we brought the good news to you, the Word of God, the gospel, it was not only with words, but it was with power, for the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance of what we said was true, and how you know our concern for you from the way that we lived were among you. Adam... uh, Albert Barnes said of this, he said, the meaning of the truth that was made effectious in their minds, that all who became true Christians, including those who uh, were, uh, were those who abandoned their sins and devoted themselves to God to lead pure, holy lives, and were enabled to do this by the Holy Spirit, who also helped them through trials and temptations in life. This book has to be more than ink on paper. It's not just another book. There are lots of books out there. But this is the book. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. For husbands, this means you should love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave up his life for her. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. That he did not present her to himself, uh, that uh, he did this to present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any kind of blemish. Instead, she will be holy without fault. Now, that scripture can spin some people out because we're cleansed not by the word of God, but by the blood of Jesus. Many times it says we were cleansed. Ephesians 1, Revelation 1, 5, Ephesians 1, 7, Colossians 1, 14. Cleansed by the word of God. By the blood of, rather, by the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18. So why would Paul write and say that we are cleansed, washed by the cleansing of God's word? Well, it's God's word that makes us realize we're dirty and need to be cleansed. Everyone's righteous in their own eyes. I've heard and read mass murderers who can try to justify what they did. How they thought they were okay. But it's the word of God that reveals and makes us realize we're dirty and we need to get cleansed. And it's the word of God that makes us realize we need to call on God for him to help us. If you don't let the word of God in, you won't be cleansed. One man said every generation, the Bible will change the values of its age and define and its definition of success. 
Every generation needs to be recalibrated back to what is the right values, what is success. Because this is the standard above all standards. This is the hope above all hopes. Acts chapter 20 is the only sermon we have of the Apostle Paul. Some say Hebrews might be a written sermon, whatever, but recorded in the book of Acts, there's only one time he preached and those words were written down. In the midst of that preaching, he said these words in verse 32. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with those that have been set apart for himself. Paul says the word of God builds you up. Literally strengthens you. Literally causes you to be strong in life. Jesus told a parable. Matthew 7, 24 through 27, he said, And anyone who listens to my teachings and follows them is wise. He's like a person who builds on a rock, solid rock. When the rain comes and the torment, the flood waters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it was built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teachings and does not do them is foolish like a person who builds his house on a sand. And when the rains and floods come and the wind beats against it, the collapse with, it will collapse with a mighty crash. In October 19th, 2010, at, uh, in the Institute of Business and Home Safety in Rickenburg, South Carolina, researchers built two 1,300 square foot houses in this facility and tested it with hurricane force winds. At first, both buildings began to would withhold. They did three different scenarios of this, and uh, they saw that the houses were fine. And they one was uh, one was built according to conventional standards. The second house included reinforced straps that connected every level of the building from the foundation to the roof. Then, when the researchers turned on the giant fans again with gusts up to 110 miles an hour, which is a category three, which in South Carolina is common, on the third attempt, the conventional house lasted 10 minutes and collapsed. The one that was reinforced did fine. Tim Reynolds, the engineer who worked on the experiment, summarized the results with this pointed question. The bottom line you have to ask yourself is which house would you rather be living in? In Jesus' parable, in the book of Thessalonica, that church received the word of God when the storms blew the winds, the floods, they survive. Which house would you rather be living in? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. You're here this evening, you're not right with God. Not saved, not born again. Maybe you've built your house on the sand. It's collapsing. Problems. Maybe you've heard the word of God. Maybe you haven't, but you realize today it's not built on God's word. And I need to get my heart right. I need God to help me to get things right this evening. And maybe that's you. This, you'd recognize yourself. I'm not, I'm not right. I'm not saved. I'm, I don't obey God. I have different opinions than what God has, which has caused me to do different things than what God has said is acceptable. If that's you tonight, you can get your heart right with God. You can respond and receive Jesus Christ as your personal 
Lord and Savior. If that's you, I wonder if you'd slip up your hand. Say, that's me. Would you pray for me, Pastor? I need to get my heart right with God tonight. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe this is exactly what it is. You, you've heard the word of God, but you haven't obeyed it. You don't agree with God. Oh, this sin is okay, or I don't have to do what he said over here, or whatever it might be. You're not arguing with man. I've, I've watched pe people argue with the preacher as he's preaching. But the problem is, I've actually been the person who's argued with the preacher while he's preaching. But the problem is, you're not really arguing with the preacher, you're arguing with God. What did God say? They received the word of God. The marks were tangible in their lives. They witnessed, they told, the evidence of repentance was there. They were doing other things than they used to be doing. They had faith towards what God wanted to do in their future. That's what we can have tonight. Let's all stand. We're going to sing and worship God as we open the altars. There is power. There is Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, all you're doing, Lord, we rejoice in your goodness and your lightness. Oh, thank God. This is the authority. Not opinion. Not polls. Not it. This is it. This word, this book. Is what who would God thinks what we need to live and align our lives. I love that quote. If this is what who God is, you line your life up with this book to please Him. That's how you please God. And you know, that's what we just need to do. This is what the Thessalonians did. This is why Paul spends two almost two chapters. You read the first two chapters of First Thessalonians and just count how many times he mentions. The gospel, the word of God, you received, you did, you obeyed. 
It's fascinating. And then, of course, he launches into other issues and, and doctrines, and as the Apostle Paul did. But the, he takes that time. He takes that. No other book does he take that kind of time. No other church does he take that kind of time and, and reiterate the Word of God. And it's such a blessing to have this book. And you have it on your phone. If you don't, you can download it. There's a million free apps. You can have it. You can read it. There's also probably a hundred English translations. You can find one that you can deal with. Just don't use the New World Translation. That's not really a good one. Other than that, just read the Bible. Whatever God will faithfully speak to you. I can promise you that. Thank God. You remember we got youth group on Friday. We've got Sunday school, 930. Continuing on in our parable, looking at the sower and the seed. Not necessarily in the Word of God, but just in breaking down like we did last time, the parable. We know what it's about, so we're going to look at how did Jesus tell it? What do we need to look for? How does this apply to our lives kind of thing? And so look forward to that. 1030, our Sunday morning service, 6 o'clock in the evening, Yanni will be ministering. It's going to be a great, great time. Let's bow our heads. Going, uh, Sawyer, would you close this in prayer? Amen.